Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the We Fix Pain podcast. This is episode number 18 with Dr. Philip Snell. And I just want to say, Doc, you are my favorite Dr. Phil. There's the guy that puts people <laughs> on the couch, but you ain't it. And you're my favorite Dr. Phil. Yeah. That's a that's a high bar. <laughs> that's it. That's we're we're it. both we're both southern boys, uh, southern redheads. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the topic for today is getting nerdy on nerves. We're going to talk about Doc's T-shirt, the neurocentric approach that he has on. We're going to talk about the nervous system, neurological rehabilitation, how to assess when the central nervous and the peripheral nervous system is getting involved. So getting nerdy on nerds is the is the uh, the, the fancy uh, euphemism for this podcast today. Um, let's introduce the podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Pappas. I'm a sports and rehabilitation based chiropractor and athletic trainer for Arosti Rehab Centers. I practice out of Austin, Texas. As Doc was mentioning, some of the best barbecue in the world here in Austin, Texas. Can't wait to get him back and get him some brisket. Um, this podcast fo focuses on health and wellness re related topics with a special emphasis on integrated neuromusculoskeletal care. It means we discuss injuries to muscles, tendons, ligaments, joints, fascia, and nerves that lead to pain. Um, we address topics like assessment, treatment, diagnosis, and rehabilitation and management of acute and chronic-based uh, injuries. We thank you for listening to this podcast and watching our pod podcast and humbly ask, if you like the content, please like, subscribe, and share. We're currently on Anchor, Spotify, and on YouTube. Uh, Dr. Snell, well, he's my favorite Dr. Phil, as you heard from the intro. He's an adjunct faculty at the University of Western States. He's an international lecturer of blending neurological assessment, pain science, manual therapy for neuromuscular conditions. He's the founder of Solution Sports and Spine in uh, uh, Re Sports and Spine Center in Portland, the co-developer of the neurocentric approach. He's sought out by healthcare providers and medical doctors across the globe to help solve challenging cases including spine pain, peripheral entrapments, and chronic pain syndromes. He was part of the largest federally funded NIH research grant in the history of chiropractic. He's the creator and content manager of five online websites, including prochiropracticonlinece.com, fixyourownback.com, dermal traction method, neurocentricapproach.com, and solution sports and spines. He's evaluated, treated, and consulted with high-level athletes, including uh, with a niche in strength athletes, power lifters, and in particular with the athletes and champions at Kabuki Strength Labs. And he has a really cool collection of pants and socks. <laughs> well, the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> I love watching uh, this airport. Just when you travel across the Portland airport, and you get the, <laughs> the socks and the pants, and I'm like, it's going to be a fun trip wherever you're going. Yeah, no doubt. Well, thanks, Dino. I really appreciate the uh, the intro, and uh, I look forward as well to coming up and showing you uh, the pants directly, and perhaps even <laughs> spilling some brisket on them. At uh, as we were mentioning, Valentino's. So. That's it. That's it. One of the best spots in Austin. Uh, so, Doc, uh, let's uh, let's do a little get to know you for our audience. We're gonna do fun five fun random questions. And then I want to know what your superhero origin story. It's important people know people's <laughs> stories. So let's do the five fun questions. And let's get to your superhero origin story. So, hey, Doc, what's your bucket list vacation? Where would you go? Ooh, um, uh, bucket list. You know, I, I think places that I've actually already been are the first that come to mind. Um, the Alps. Um, my wife and I like to get on trails and go for long walks, uh, hut to hut in the, the mountains around the world. And, uh, right now I'm watching that, uh, Tour de France, uh, documentary on Netflix and just chomping at the bit, looking at, uh, Laupe d'Huez and Mont Blanc, which we've walked around. So that's, uh, that's probably up there high on the list. So French Alps more so than the Italian or Swiss. Oh boy, I've we've For been to we've been to the Austrian Alps, the Italian Alps, the Swiss Alps, and the French Alps. Um, they're all gorgeous. Although the 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 Dolomites and the Dolomites in uh, north northeastern Italy might be uh, that might have them all topped, but you know there's still a lot of still a lot of trails and a lot of mountains to be seen yet. That's it. That's it. Yeah. 
And uh, I, yeah, you're right. This is July 15th today. Tour de France is, is hot and heavy right now. And it's, man, what those guys go through uh, to, to complete and finish that race is amazing. And I know that sport's been tainted with, you know, doping and performance enhancing drugs, but the fact that anybody could do it with or without is still yeah. an impressive feat. All right. Yeah. What's your uh, most interesting say what moment in healthcare? A patient said something to you and you're like, what did you just say? Can you clarify? Um, well, one of the, the interesting things about one, being in practice for a longer period of time, two, developing some kind of, you know, persona um, rightfully or, or not so rightfully uh, dictated by the whims and vagaries of social media and all of this type of stuff. Um, but you wind up uh, over time starting to get more patients with that have been to a variety of different places um, and um, and have a variety of different complaints. Um, you know, I've got, uh, you know, just this morning had I, I think it's probably um, sexual health and um uh pelvic floor issues that give me the say what um you know, <laughs> one individual one individual that um came in with a uh a problem with uh, that the history suggested a possible penile fracture but he had oh. um a two year uh history of intermittent a constant baseline pain, but intermittent pain that waxed and waned um, with erection. And um, it was significant enough that um, it had taken a relatively young man out of uh, all of his physical activity had taken him out of school and uh, trying to make sense of all of that with the, you know, the expected um, psychological overlay and try to direct referrals appropriately um, was, uh, yeah, that was definitely a say what moment. And to some degree still is because, you know, the poor guy has been around the block and a lot of people just immediately you say you've got a, a burning pain in that particular area. And a lot of people are just like, hey, not my area, man. Don't want to talk about it. Don't want to deal with it. And it's not my area, but um, it's a human being in pain in front of me that's asking me for help. So I'm going to do my level best to try to uh, put my biases and, and uh, concerns aside and step up to the plate as best I can. I had uh, a funnier, funny one. It's not quite as <laughs> relevant or important to the patient. I had somebody suggesting for years and years and years, and they actually called me out on this because it was a personal injury claim that came to me on the first session. This was a person that was never wrong. Never, like we know the type, like they're not wrong. And no matter what anatomical uh, charts that you'll point to, it's the chart's not right. He referred to his sacrum as his scrotum. And um, every time he would be like, yeah, my scrotum hurts, my scrotum hurts. On the first initial evaluation, I'm just like, can you point to where your scrotum is? And he pointed clearly and distinctly to his sacrum. And I'm like, okay. And I pointed to the anatomical chart. No, that ain't it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I just rolled with the punches. Two years later, because it was a personal injury case, I got audited oh. on my notes. He oh. goes to his attorney and said, he has a mistake in his notes. The attorney called me and like you're you're the, the client is telling me something that's different than what you are what were you explaining? I'm like, I told him once I didn't have the heart to tell him that he is wrong and it is a sacrum. So the patient then came to my office and tried to berate me that I had <laughs> made a mistake in the note. Like this story keeps going and I'm like, I'm just gonna clarify this right now that you anatomically listed an incorrect area and I try to clarify and I just roll with it and treat it. And you got somewhat better, which is what we anticipated and expected. Your outcome was supposed to anticipate and expected, but you got it wrong and the notes are correct. And they actually help your case in court. I got a call from the attorney a month later because the client was so 
difficult to deal with the 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 attorney just dropped dropped the client altogether so you know for yeah. for the story is he mistook his sacred for restorative and refused to admit I, i'm wrong <laughs> so not quite as serious yeah. as yours that was the state what yeah. moment in healthcare. where where is your scrotum oh, okay okay <laughs> Um, all right. Next question. What's the mom and dad? I, f- I finally made it moment for you. Hmm. You know, honestly, I think it was probably, um, you know, some of the, the, the first trips to Europe. Um, I grew up in a modest household in uh, rural Eastern North Carolina and uh, nobody where I grew up traveled. Uh, nobody, uh, certainly went on vacations to Europe. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think probably I, I, I can remember, um, the first night in Florence, I was so ecstatic by that, that I was, uh, you know, totally jet lagged with my son and my wife, uh, with me. <laughs> that I was just like, oh, wow, I've made it, you know, and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we're sitting outside at like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night uh, at an Italian, uh, well, of course, Italian restaurant in Florence. And, uh, you know, some some folks come strolling by, play the accordion and everything. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is great. So I reach into my back pocket, first trip to Europe, right? Reach into my back back pocket thing one open up my wallet thing two pull out a buck you know yeah yeah thanks for the music you know and that was the last i saw of my wallet Um, because because by at some point we figure probably when i was getting up and getting out and after a few carafes of uh uh wine i was uh (laughs) Uh, conspicuously lighter in my right back pocket. Yeah. I didn't find that out until the next day. So, yeah. Uh, things in the United States that uh, we, we don't worry that much about are things in foreign yeah. countries. Yeah. Um, all right. Last uh, two major questions. We'll get through this real quick and we'll get to your superhero origin story. Uh, beat the heat. Uh, I live in Texas. Heat index 113, 115. It's uh, cooking around the country. What's your favorite beat the heat activity? Ah, uh, for me, it's probably a sauna. <laughs> uh, I grew up in uh, probably a sauna uh, in uh, eastern North Carolina, where I grew up. Uh, we're no strangers to the kind of weather that you're talking about. And I lived in San Antonio mm. for four years as well. I didn't know that. Um, so, uh, yeah, the heat doesn't really bother me. I actually enjoy it. I like a heat 113 heat index. I, um, I'm sitting on my deck in front of my house. Our heat index actually today, it won't be the same as yours, but um, we're, we'll hit 93 today here. Um, but I remember last year when we had our heat dome, uh, year before last, when we had our heat dome, and it was 116 as I was sitting out here. Ooh. That that might have been the, uh, the, the, that was definitely the hottest I've ever experienced. And I, I didn't like that. <laughs> All right. But Last yeah, I, I actually actually like to prep myself for uh, the heat by spending a lot of time in saunas. All right. Last question here. You're about to present on an international stage. Big, big presentation, big conference. You've been asked, what's your walk up song? Ooh, uh, it's got to be the uh, the the one from uh, Eminem, the. Uh, the uh uh the theme from from eight eight mile yeah yeah lose yourself yeah, lose yourself it's gotta, it's, it's gotta yeah. be that it's gotta be that or or try. or uh <laughs> black hole sun from uh yeah. from from Soundgarden <laughs> since i've got you know a pretty solid connection with that band yep and being up in the pack northwest i bet it has more more relevance all right. Yeah, so I, got to, I got to hear story? that song six six months before it was actually released. So that was kind of nice, cool. Nice. What's your superhero origin story? How did you end up as a chiropractor? How did you end up in with a niche and focus in rehabilitation uh, uh, medicine? And and how did you end up with you know your your skill set and your training? I'll try to make that brief. I'm, um, I was originally in school for mechanical engineering back in the day. Um, I 
didn't feel I was very attracted to the systems mindset and still still am and still try to carry that over in my work. But um, <laughs> I wasn't as mathematically strong as I should have been to be in engineering school. Uh, I wandered, uh, essentially. Sometimes I joke that I retired in my 20s. Um, I traveled the country by bicycle. I wound up in the Pacific Northwest and um, I ran a sea kayak touring business in the San Juan Islands in um, uh, northern Washington. I lived in Seattle, as I was just suggesting before the uh, oh, about the time that the grunge thing was popping off. Um, yeah, I had uh, yeah, I was trying to figure out what the hell it was I wanted to do. And I started back in school for uh, actually for psychology when I met my then girlfriend, now wife of uh, going on 30 years. And she was a pretty, yeah, she was a pretty highfalutin uh, research psychologist in one of the top labs in the country. And she's now the, currently the second author on the most um, uh, cited paper in depression research in the field of psychology. And uh, she's the one that actually developed the rubric for, minimum change necessary for meaningful clinical um, uh, uh, clinical effect. So we see that bleeding over into our world and stuff now. But yeah, if you look, yeah. look, look there for her name, her last name is Truax, T-R-U-A-X, and you'll see that okay. on there as second author. But uh, she talked me out of going to into psychology because despite all of that, those accolades with her, she really didn't enjoy the field all that much. And it was making a lot of changes. So uh, it was in going back to school that I, in my biology classes, I remembered how much I enjoyed biology and, uh, and, and uh, physiology from my earlier days. I was very interested in sport uh, from my early teens. I've always been an athlete. I was always interested in trying to find a way to be better than my brothers. And I was the youngest in my family and they were much faster and much stronger. And of course, older than me. Uh, so I chose stamina. I always decided that I was going to be able to suffer more than the next person. So endurance athletics appealed to me quite a bit. And um, that all kind of launched me into Cairo. I was very much interested in manual therapy early on. I had a lot of exposure to a variety of body work um, uh, methodology, had uh, formative relationships with massage therapy trainers and things of that sort. And um, so manual therapy was there, sports medicine was there when I went to school and I had a, a pretty deep background on chiropractic as well, having been a consumer from about the age of 12. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I learned how to think more scientifically, blessedly, at, um, in my training as uh, in chiropractic at Western States. And um, the rest has been sort of just a uh, almost uh, sometimes I suggest it's almost a narcissistic uh, path for me in the profession. I've been trying to figure out my own orthopedic issues and sports injuries from getting my ass kicked uh, over the years on a variety of different uh, playing fields. So uh, including right now, as I sit here, I've got a grade two uh, MCL tear. Oh, wow. <laughs> just happened two days ago so uh yeah. Tra- traumatic uh or yeah just... i was uh at a dog in a at a park with my brother-in-law and his 110 pound uh uh doberman uh plowed into me from the side while i was oh. bending down to pick up a ball and weight bearing on the leg so uh, i was lucky apparently that my acl and medial meniscus didn't give up the ghost yeah, that's a position where you can get multiple structures. If you came out with a grade two MCL, it sounds like a bad win, yeah, but a it's, win. Yeah, I'll, I'll call it. I'll call it a win. Yeah, yeah. So, Doc, what is the neurocentric approach? You've kind of refined your craft over years, and you've kind of taken a little this, a little bit of that in the fields of manual therapy and rehabilitation medicine. You've come up with a 
really unique style, a unique approach called the neurocentric approach. What is it? Uh, it's an integrative uh, systems-based approach for, uh, as I describe it, for assessment and treatment um, for patients in a physical medicine environment, not just chiropractic, but I would um, suggest that it would extend over ATC, uh, physical therapy, physiatry, and even orthopedics. Um, what I'm uh, trying to do with it, I guess, I guess it, it came about, uh, I didn't set out to put some sort of unified field theory or anything together, but uh, I was taught for, for instance, a diversified technique of manipulation at Western States, combining a whole lot of different approaches uh, into um, a pick and choose kind of model for applying the therapy of manipulation. And that always kind of resonated with me. And I've done essentially um, by rote examination and empiricism over the years, I've behaved that way with manual therapy and I behave that way with exercise therapy in my practice, trying to stay well read in, in all of those domains. But it wasn't until I took a sabbatical several years ago for a year, and I have um, the, the privilege of having quite a few medical doctors in the, the greater Portland area that refer to me on a pretty regular basis. And uh, when I announced that I was going on sabbatical for a year, they said, well, that's great. Uh, Billy, you, uh, who do we send um, send our, our referrals to while you're gone? And I didn't have an associate at the time. And I was like, hmm, uh, I, I, I'll give you some names. He said, well, who does what you do? And I was like, well, you know, candidly, I, I, I don't know of others in this area that are doing anything like this. And I said, well, what's it called? I can Google it, you know? I'm like, it's called 20 years of, of geekish reading of the literature and empirical practice and uh, in a patient-centered approach. And they're like, well, that's too long. We can't call it that. <laughs> and, and we spun forward to um, my first associate later, uh, Dr. Justin Dean, Years after he had left, we were at a course together down in um, L.A., and he was relatively new to the Santa Monica area and was having great success um, there meeting and networking into, you know, essentially a patient roster of the rich and famous. And um, the and he, he was like, Philip, you you got to come down here. Uh, this is this is really an incredible market and the things that we're doing, nobody else is doing anywhere around here. And I was like, Justin, I don't want to live in LA. And he's like, he's like, uh, no offense to you guys that live in LA, <laughs> carry on. But, uh, Portland's more my vibe. And, uh, and he said, well, we should, we should a lot better, do a lot some better donuts. It's a lot better going except in Portland. <laughs> he said, he said we, should call, we should define this thing that we're doing and um, we should call it something and we should share it with other people. So that was the origins of the neurocentric approach. The name actually was um, from uh, Guido uh, Reisingham uh, and it happened just about, 30 feet that way uh, by my kitchen table in, I think it was January of 2020, right before the, the, um, the COVID pandemic popped and Guido and Justin uh, came up and I put them up here at my house and we had a brainstorming session about what to call this, how to organize the course notes and how to start putting uh, in-person courses together. And of course, COVID had other ideas in mind and still does to some extent. Yeah. So we've been pivoting right along with the rest of you and uh, trying to figure out how we're going to get this material out. And I think I've got a beat on it now as to how we're actually going to, to get it out there and better uh, disseminated to other people. Doc, you've mentioned the word system several times, systems-based approach. Everybody kind of has their own interpretation of that. What is 
a systems-based approach mean for you? Uh, well, it, it's it's actually relatively well defined um, out there in the literature. It is tends to be bandied about in engineering circles relatively uh, commonly. But um, if you want to look at simple example, well, not simple, but um, uh, examples that we see in our face on a regular basis, how about uh, the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, how about uh, solving environmental problems associated with global warming? A systems-based, uh, a systems approach refers to a, a relatively complex system, which is made up of smaller integral parts. And all of those parts have inputs into the system and outputs. And the frustrating thing with human uh, psychology seems to be that we have, owing to Danny Kahneman's uh, thinking fast and slow kind of stuff that you can explore in his books, um, we have an immediate knee-jerk response, or fast thinking, if you will, um, that sometimes doesn't quite agree, but seems to override our slow thinking, which is that scientific thinking that I was referring to a little bit earlier. Um, a systems approach takes into account the latency of the response from those inputs. So sometimes when you and I are working clinically with a patient, um, the way that we might integrate such things is we have to apply an input. All right, we're going to do this manual therapy or we're going to do this exercise intervention and we might, it might take a while for us to see benefit. And you have to scale the patient's expectations to that, or you have to scale your time in and time out uh, in order to think about that. And we kind of use the clinical audit process as best as we can based on current evidence, suggesting that a within, within treatment benefit would suggest a um, benefit over a course of care in a treatment plan as well. So um, I guess that's a, a little bit of a long-winded way of saying it's a whole lot of things working together in complex ways, and you and I are going to input something into it and then see how it comes out on the other side. And um, we very empirically work that with our patients uh, in using this particular um, methodology that we call the neurocentric approach. Gotcha. So what, when you start to get into the systems-based approach or your neurocentric approach, what lenses of evaluation kind of serve as a guide for what does this patient have and what do we do with this patient? So what types of styles or lenses of evaluation or filters do you use as an entry point into this neurocentric approach? Well, there's... Um... Uh, as I was mentioning before, there's assessment and there's treatment, um, and the treatment typically is going to be something that looks like manual followed by something that looks like exercise. And the things that we have within the uh, NCA right now are primarily um, things that I've already learned, um, but things that I'm still learning and things that I hope to learn. Um, Justin, in his work, has gotten very interested in uh, um, the functional neurology work of Carrick. Uh, he's gotten very interested in Guy Voyer's work for um, uh, joint mobilization, joint pumping, so-called, and, uh, and things of that sort. And, um, but, you know, when, when we do our in-person in coursework, he shares some of that. Um, but the input, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking as I start to answer this, my, uh, I've got some slides from some of my presentations that I queued up in anticipation of some of these questions. Uh, if you want, I can share and uh, toss a, uh, and that might make it more expedient. Yeah, give me one second. Let's see if I can pump this guy up here. I'm not quite sure how to uh, on this. Let's see here. 
Uh, no, I'd have to have the presentation up myself. Okay, um, never mind. Talk, talk us through it, Doc. Talk us through it. So the idea um, from an assessment standpoint, we do what you and I uh, are trained to do. First, we talk to a patient and take a history. In the history, um, we look for specific things that might relate to uh, this sort of neurocentric approach. And the way that I have set the NCA material up to try to make it a, easier to take a whole bunch of these complex items and leverage it effectively and consistently <clears throat> in patient encounter after patient encounter during the day, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is to think from bigger neuro down to smaller neuro. And bigger neuro, of course, is the brain. And in that, we're thinking, yes, brain physiology associated with concussion, but also pain neuroscience comes into that <clears throat> uh, program as well. And then the next biggest neuro we're going to deal with is spinal cord. And then from spinal cord, the IVF and the nerve root interface. And then from there, uh, mixed motor nerves in the periphery. And then from there, cutaneous nerves in the periphery. And even lower to that, um, cellular effects that might sensitize neurology. And we, in the history for the assessment, we're going to pick up clues about uh, some of that brain-based uh, input and some of the cellular-based stuff. So where's that going to come from? The brain-based stuff is what does the patient think is going on? What are their beliefs? What are their prior um, experiences with other providers? What have they been told that their diagnosis is? You know, one of the simplest ways of, of confronting that very early on that uh, we see on a regular basis is patients like an uh, older patient with knee pain going up and down stairs and with squatting. And, you know, they're standing in front of you and, um, you know, they've already told you, I think I might need a new knee. Do you think I need a new knee? I had an x-ray. It shows that I've got bone on bone arthritis. My orth orthopedist told me I've got bone on bone arthritis. And I have them to squat and I see commonly two things. One, there's a valgus tendency on the knee that may or may not be uh, significant. And uh, two, they tend to report that the pain is on the medial aspect of the knee. And my thinking immediately goes to what nerves service that particular area they're experiencing complainants or what structure is involved and what functional contributors might be at play, the, the valgus issue. So I can test both of those. I can reach down and uh, a couple of spots above and below the knee where the saphenous neurology that is the primary innervation for the medial compartment of the knee and in areas where that saphenous nerve is relatively superficial, I can just alter the mechanical landscape by lifting and creating some space in that area. I can do it using a cup. I can do it using my hand. And then we'll have the person to repeat the same thing that was painful before, go up and down stairs, <clears throat> or squat and rise and see if your pain's any better. And in so doing... So you're, you're talking about creating a, a decompression effect of the nerve by pulling the nerve away from the surrounding soft tissues and then auditing it out in this example. Yes, yes. Okay. And that that is theoretical. Um, the, the idea is building on top of the evidence on uh, mechanical sensitivity in nerves and what happens when you make a nerve mechanically sensitive, both at uh, an organismal level and also at a cellular level. And uh, in that particular patient, just to finish the analogy there, we do a little tug-tug and the patient feels um, less pain with squatting then we've got immediately a challenge to their bias of what they already were thinking. I've been told that I have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis and that I might need a new knee. And clearly, tugging on the skin is not affecting bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. So therein, you start to develop an entirely more of a novel mindset in that particular patient and, and uh, now they're open to the possibility that maybe they're not as bad off as they thought. You can continue to audit the valgus bit in the same way. You know, 
uh, we can argue until the cows come home in a heterogeneous cohort of people with knee, with knee pain and without about whether or not a valgus tendency in gait patterns is, um, is significant or not. But in the patient in front of me right now, if I cue them to externally rotate their, uh, their femur a bit more with you know, some gluteal cueing, and they are able now to squat, and we don't see the valgus tendency, and they feel less pain, it would infer, not definite cause and effect relationship, but it would infer that that probably has something to do with the present presenting pain uh, in that particular individual at that time. At the very least, again, no matter how much we're arguing, I'm getting them moving, and it doesn't cost much. <laughs> and there's very low um, likelihood of any negative effect from the things that we're doing with that. So why not explore it? So just to tie this together for our listeners and viewers, you're presenting a pretty clear scenario. And the scenario is we have a radiographic finding that may or may not have clinical value. Now we intersperse that with a patient's perceived beliefs, what they've been told, especially by a uh, authority source, uh, a doctor, hey, you have bone on bone, you need a knee replacement, and and your neck of the woods, can we modulate? We're not changing the bone on bone. Sensitization of the local uh, area, both the soft tissues, the bony component, and the, more importantly, the superficial nerve, by creating some decompression around the nerve, modulate symptoms, modulate their experience at the brain level, start to turn down threat or perceived threat, start to rewire their beliefs, maybe this bone on bone is not going to need a procedure. That's the totality of, of this example. And what you're trying to convey is, hey, uh, sometimes, um, you know, um, I'm trying to use a, a funny saying, uh, sometimes it looks like a duck, acts like a duck, quacks like a duck, and it's a duck. And sometimes maybe maybe it's not. Yeah, that uh, I think that's a fair assessment. The um, in that particular individual, also what we're doing with the latter scenario with the valgus issue, and also with the the to refer to it the DTM the uh, dermal traction method um, aspect of what we were just doing with the saponous nerve in that example we've now given them a locus of control. We now show them that they can think differently and move differently and intervene in some way in their own behalf that reduces their pain in between treatments. So gotcha. now we now over time, we have an opportunity to reduce the need for care and reduce healthcare expenditure as well uh, in all of in all of these issues. Now, let me ask you and anyone else that's listening to this, all right, let's take the same scenario. We've got the person with uh, an anteromedial knee pain with squatting and ascending and descending stairs. What are some other aspects that might be related to that knee pain? Well, how about obesity? Um, if we know from the research on this, if that patient drops 10 pounds, they're likely to have less knee pain. We also know that if they are obese, they're more likely to be diabetic or pre-diabetic, and, and if they are, then as a diabetic, they are about 30 to 40% more likely to have back pain, shoulder pain, and knee pain. And why is that? Because of the change mechanical sensitivity of the nerves in the body because of the issues associated with um, uh, blood sugar management, basically, to keep it at a very high level. Uh, yeah, discussion. it's a sensitizing agent for the nervous yeah. system. So that's the cellular consume, part. Yeah, that's the cellular okay. part of the assessment. So in the assessment, taking your history, you find out that you know um, they're they've been trying to lose weight for a good long period of time. They got a family history of type two diabetes. You ask them about their diet, and they're not really monitoring things so well. They've got a, uh, a, a tendency towards a sweet tooth, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that might not be the thing that you want to lead with. As I tell my students, you know, when the patient's bleeding out in the ER and you've determined that their, you know, their HbA1c is off the charts, that's not the time to have a discussion with them about managing their, their blood sugar. <laughs> it's the time to stop the effing bleeding. 
So yeah. that's um, that's kind of, you know what you're doing in the NCA bit there is you're flagging that, tracking it, because in that particular individual, over time they're going to be less likely to hurt if you're able to convince them to make some positive lifestyle changes that will reduce their weight and improve their blood sugar management. And now you've got a way to use pain in that patient as a constructive lever towards modification of known problems with systemic health. So that's essentially what we're trying to do with a neurocentric approach is to bring all of these elements that have been identified in the literature to date and hopefully whatever comes down the pike in the future and put it together into something that makes sense so that we at least consider mechanical sensitivity of neurology in our physical medicine exam. Because if we don't consider that, we will not find it. We will not see it. And I would go so far as to say that this is probably the fourth cardinal sign of, neurolo of, of the neurological exam that needs to happen in our space. And the evidence is there to support it, but the evidence also would suggest that there's a 16 year lag time between the clinical development of the clinical evidence and the implementation of the clinical evidence. So I'm trying to shorten that by putting something together that's easy to consume. I mean, I, gotcha. I would say it's not, it's not entirely different than something like Gray Cook has done. Gray didn't invent you know, the, the elements of the, of the FMS, but, but he put them together into a rubric that makes sense. It's easy to understand and easy to apply. And that's essentially yeah. at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to steal things from the other people, the, the, the wonderful teachers that I've had the benefit of spending time with, like Stu McGill, like Michael Shacklock, um, learning uh, Robin McKenzie's work, and Pavel Tsatsalian, all of these people that have taught me the things that I've learned and I'm trying to integrate. I'm not trying to knock their stuff off and steal it. I'm just trying to put it all together into um, a good recipe that's easy to follow. Yeah, gotcha. It's blending all this great information from multiple different sources into a cohesive framework to accelerate the learning curve so that we can treat, manage, and, and ultimately help these people uh, more effectively and efficiently. Yeah. I mean, you guys at Arosti, you know, you, you have a version of that as well, if I understand the Arosti model relatively well. Um, and, you know, um, Mike Neely up here is a, uh, in outside of um, Seattle and the Olympia area. Mike is a very good friend of mine. Uh, we were in school together and we have regular, regular contact with each other. And um, I, uh, you know, so I can appreciate the need for developing a more streamlined approach to uh, leverage and predict the results that you're going to have in uh, in working with uh, with a patient. And um, so we got into the evaluation and assessment lenses, and the evaluation and assessment lenses is you know physical exam, uh, functional exam. You mentioned the person with the knee valgus on the squat looking and checking about peripheral sensitization, looking at the health history for a diabetic, what lenses of treatment or what styles of treatment uh, do you utilize? Uh, I, I looked on the website and did a little homework. You mentioned the topics of graded nerve treatment, transverse ner nerve modes, dermal traction method, and then other manual methods. I think um, people have kind of loosely heard of those topics. Can you give us a little specificity? What is a graded nerve treatment? Um, it's our term that we coined to try to explain the thing that we're due. Um, the, uh, it's kind of interesting that in, you know, as I, the dermal traction method, which we originally called YAP, and that's a conversation for another time, <laughs> but the, um, the, and it, it was stuff that I had been doing for a number of years. And then when Justin and then subsequently Ben Ramos, um, came and spent time in my office, I, uh, I showed them this to see if it was reproducible and they were quite enamored with it. 
And, um, you know, we tongue in cheek said, well, we got to call it something. If we're going to call it something, it's got to have a three letter acronym because everybody knows that in physical medicine, if it doesn't have a three letter acronym, it'll never be successful. So, right. uh, yeah, graded, graded nerve treatment uh, and graded nerve assessment, a G and a G is our little, again, we're being tongue in cheek here, but a graded nerve assessment is first look <laughs> at the area and then apply progressively um, deeper, more invasive manual technique. First, just a superficial skin grab. Second, a deeper um, uh, transverse nerve mobilization, literally trying to get, um, see if you can palpate the mechanically sensitive nerve, which would typically be a bit uncomfortable. And then rather than laying on it and mashing on it, get right beside it and try to see if you can pull it while the person is moving. The idea just being for anyone mechanically minded that you're trying to improve a putative sliding dysfunction if there is one. The evidence would suggest that these sliding dysfunctions are not uncommon and that when they occur, the net effect is to reduce perfusion of the nerve. And based on Artem Patapudium's research that got him um, a co-award for the Nobel Prize in 2021 for discovering the Paisio 1 and Paisio 2 um, receptors on nerves, which is the actual thing that changes, that makes a, a normal nerve now become mechanically sensitive, so we're trying to leverage things that we can do to improve the perfusion of the nerve and make it less mechanically sensitive. Um, and that nerve might have an abnormal ectopic generation point, as David Butler described um, a number of years ago, uh, or it could just be that the whole downstream nerve owing to um, a lack of perfusion for a long enough period of time has made the nerve mechanically sensitive. Now, that's where the, the domino kind of tilt tips towards brain because now you've got your calm systems mechanically sensitive and the body will intervene to try to protect those nerves. And the intervention is where you and I were taught in our clinical work to pay attention to, that's tight muscles. And most of our training stopped right there. It's like, well, you look for a tight muscle, you assume that's the problem, and then you create a system that kind of explains it with circular reasoning with myofascial trigger point syndrome, and then you leverage a bunch of treatment towards those putative myofascial trigger points. Well, what do we know? If a person has a lot of those things that we call myofascial trigger points, it does change their upstairs perception of their body and tends to increase central sensitization. In animal models, we see that if you create a neuropathic pain model, we see the same kind of changes in the brain. We see the same kind of changes in DNA methylation patterns in the genes that are associated with pain in the brain. Um, so we can intervene at that level by assessing the neurology. First, you got to look, and then two, getting in there and trying to see if we can change the mechanical landscape around the nerve in order to change perfusion. Now, I stopped at the, the next level of depth of trying to get down to transverse nerve mobilization. And then beyond that, it's kind of, uh, it starts to look more like cross fiber friction which starts to look reminiscent of um, something like uh, fascial uh, manipulation, which is a wonderful manual therapy technique from uh, the Stecco folks over in Italy. And uh, that Warren Hammer has had uh, the, the, the opportunity to share with us here in the U.S. And I've studied with Warren and with Antonio there in that particular work as well. Yeah, you bring up some interesting points. I think in Cairo school, we get taught tight muscle and then choose your given technique, whether it's ART, whether it's grassed in, and you're trying to throw, uh, you know, hammer and a nail analogy, right? Like you yeah. never stop and think, why is this problem here to begin with? What's the reason for it? 
and all the way down from the cellular level to the spinal cord, to the brain, to the external environment can manifest with tension. And a lot of times we are treating, yep. uh, we're, you know, in chiropractic, we like to say we don't, you know, uh, treat symptoms. We treat the underlying problem. And they refer to this uh, amorphous uh, subluxation theory. But we do treat symptoms because if you're just treating the tension without figuring out the while there, you're no better than handing a pill for an ibuprofen for an ankle sprain or you have a fever and you're giving somebody a Tylenol. It's no different. So completely, yeah, it's- completely, completely agree there. That is, you know, the, you know, to go back to the, the, you know, the founding story on the yap stuff and all, I very reluctantly talked about that. And I really didn't talk about it very loudly. Why? Because it was always part of a system in my mind. Yeah. And the system hadn't been hadn't been defined well yet. And that's what we're trying yeah. to do with neurocentric approach. And, you know, you're, you're McKenzie trained. And to my mind, it's no different than, um, you know, doing prone press ups for a, you know, as a directional preference yeah. for a ridiculous symptom. You know, I call that um, with my students, I call that uh, McKenzie purgatory. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, don't don't ever bother describing the phenomenology of why the radiculopathy is there and what the patient has control of in their day in, day out basis about reducing exposure to that particular provocation. No, let's just do some nice little movements that you can do that take your pain away. Well, that's better than nothing, but you know, it's at the end yeah, of the day, think, it's, uh, it's not it's not satisfying to me. Yeah, we all fall uh, victims to, um, you know, we learn something and we think that's the end, end all be all. And the reality is there are very few true integrated systems that kind of act as a roadmap for when to apply the right tool to the right issue. It's the same thing when I learned acupuncture. You can do this, this, and yeah. this pattern. And like, great. Yeah. Where yeah. and when and who do I use this for? So Yeah, you, you nail it um, there. Uh, you, you nail it there, Dino. It's the... Uh, and that really is what we're trying to do. You and I have both experienced the exact same phenomenology where you go to a course and you go spend a weekend uh, learning a new process or new technique and a continuing education thing. And then it seems like for the next two weeks, everything you see <laughs> is filtered through that lens. And now you have new eyes. And then what happens? Do you become immediately all of that no you kind of integrate it and then you try to figure out uh, which tool do i pull out of the box and then you know the, for an analogy you got a patient in front of you you got your toolbox over here and you're like yeah i don't know if i need a screwdriver here i think i need a screwdriver but i don't know if i need a phillips head or uh you know an allen wrench or a flat blade I, i'm not quite sure so that's what we're trying to do is to help you organize your toolbox better. As, as part of the neurocentric approach, exercise is an integral and critical uh, portion of it from what I understand. So what types of things do you fall back on uh, in terms of your prescription habits? Uh, I know you integrate some neurodevelopmental concepts. You mentioned some McKenzie concepts. What is your priority for prescribing or recommending an exercise? Well, I guess to to best answer that, I'd have to divide uh, the homework into two different domains, and one would be structural things that need to be that can be done to reduce um, the irritation of the structure, and then the second would be based on a functional assessment, what things can be done to improve function to reduce the likelihood of the irritable structure. And I try to organize my patient's mindset around around that as well, because the first dealing with the structural stuff is what we were just talking about. There's your prone press ups, there's YAP or DTM, there's whatever you want to do to reduce pain. But then you got to ask the question, why did this happen? And you try to address that. So that is something that we haven't talked about. Well, in the structural end of things, I lean heavily towards um, neural, um, particularly influenced by Michael Shacklock's work, but also David Butler's and uh, also Bob Elvey's uh, work there. Um, and um, 
uh, the structural issue, uh, be uh, leveraging elements that we've developed from the uh, DTM and the transverse nerve mobilization uh, stuff uh, from Shacklock's work, opening phenomenology from McKenzie's work, uh, the repetitive end range loading, that would be in the structural bucket. And then over in the functional bucket, part and parcel, I'm very heavily uh, influenced by the DNS work. It was one of my first um, exposures in terms of uh, clinical interventions. Um, I've studied and uh, with and hosted those courses um, for uh, 10 years or more now. And um, it, it, from a functional perspective, I don't think there's much that, uh, that can't be solved in a physical medicine environment by DNS. Uh, my only uh, uh, problem with it, I guess you might say, is sometimes it takes longer than I feel like it needs to um, if that's the only tool that you're using. And that's why I think the first bucket of using the things that we can leverage to reduce mechanical sensitivity, reduce structural irritation at the same time that we're adding something like the DNS functional issues, um, then that's where I think we see the, the quicker results that we're trying to achieve with the, the neurocentric approach. So, you know, I, I would suggest go do the Shacklock courses, go do the McKenzie courses, go do the Stu McGill courses, go do the DNS courses and um, do them all. And if you find yourself in the same kind of scenario that I was mentioning earlier that you and I have undoubtedly found ourselves in of how do I integrate all of this into something, that's where we're trying to step up to the plate. Yeah, I've got uh, uh, my own uh, biases like like you do. And, um, you know, I've, I've stripped those down over the years and saying, uh, you know, essentially what's going to get the patient the best result in the quickest amount of time with the best chance they're going to run with it and be independent. And now I've taken all those biases out and I apply the tools and it's taken about I don't know, 13 years of trial and error and failure uh, to come to that point in time. But I agree, put the fire out first with your structural stuff, look global and try to keep it as simple as possible because people do well with simple and execution. And if they can yep. tie it to this makes me feel better, it's going to keep me better in a real short amount of time using your clinical audit process. That's the gold rather than complexity. So even to this day, I struggle with the DNS stuff like you mentioned. Because unfortunately, it seems to get too complex in the execution to the patient. Uh, so I kind of use it as a framework that tells me um, how to progress or regress any simple exercise that I've given without, you know, taking 10, 15, 20 minutes to cue somebody on something they did when they were eight months old. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah, there's um, always, I've always been uh, somewhat mystified by a, a seeming irony with the DNS material that we're working with what is supposed to be an N8 developmental holographic memory in the brain. And yet we're using uh, verbal uh, internal cueing strategies to try to promote it in the individual. And we're talking about it a lot, even though it's something that we should theoretically already know how to do well. So yeah, I, I think we still got to learn some my, things myself, there. I get yeah, it's the execution I get caught up caught up in um, to to explain this and then try to tell a patient to undo something that they learned eight months ago and then to execute yeah. it when they haven't executed yeah. that in thirty or forty years. It's a hard thing, but it gives me a framework of understanding what the problem is, why things are wrong, what direction I want to go, and I utilize it how to progress, regress, or as Charlie Weingroff says, how to lateralize, how to slide to the side uh, for a different choice or selection. Um, mm -hmm. let me, uh, let me, uh, uh, switch gears here a little bit. So, um, you're, you're, sounds like you like barbecue. I like barbecue as well. We're going to create a nice dish. We're going to create a good barbecue dinner here. We're going to, um, sh you know, uh, figure out what the menu is. We're going to shop for the ingredients. We're going to, uh, you know, smoke that brisket 12, 13 hours at 225. We're going to prepare the dish. We're going to you know, make it presentable. We're going to serve it. And then we're going to get 
feedback on that dish from our it's making me hungry talking about this but from yeah me too serve the dish to yeah yeah let's transpose that to building the ultimate back now you're a master at working with some of the strength athletes some of the best strength athletes in the united states and i imagine some of them have back problems so we want to create a robust (laughs) and build an ultimate back we're going to use that chef analogy how do we prepare the strategy for the dish what ingredients or what are we looking for to build an ultimate back you know the uh first off the terminology the ultimate back I, I i i don't typically use that terminology and i don't want any of your listeners to get um confused there cuz that is uh, a title on uh Stu McGill's book um and Stu's work figures heavily into the work that i do with fix your own back um and uh, the fix your own back system kind of grew out of a conversation that i had similar to this with um Stu McGill, when I first launched uh, my rehab exercise a number of years ago, that some of your uh, listeners might uh, have been exposed to. But the um, I use in my teachings and courses a similar analogy of how to bake a cake. Um, so I'll kind of come in sideways to your question with that. Most of the elements of, you know, bulletproofing a back or, you know, making it more, making a person more resilient against injury. Most of the information about what to do is already out there. It's the same thing that we've just been talking about. It's the patient, and we've all experienced this, has already gone online. They've already Googled their particular condition of what they think they've got going on or Googled their symptoms, or now they tossed it in the chat GPT. And they're getting some kind of an idea of um, what, you know, what's going on with their body. And they start doing a bunch of things. The whole reason I, I put Fix Your Own back together ultimately is because it was right after Google bought YouTube. And I saw an uptick in patients arriving in my office with back pain that didn't have it before because they were doing the things that trainers, personal trainers, on Google, on uh, YouTube, we're telling them to do. And, you know, I was like, well, I'm going to try to wade into this with some semi-scientific at best um, uh, understanding of exercise science. So how are we going to build that back? It's more about, uh, it's less about the ingredients themselves because most people know what we need to do. We need to exercise some. You need to get a decent amount of sleep. Uh, you need to manage your stress relatively well, um, and uh, your and probably avoid um, wolf too much willful self poisoning with too much brisket or too much um, or too much alcohol. <laughs> Is there such which, a thing? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so you know, I would say that the beauty is in the ordering of the process. And there again is what we're trying to do with both the Fix Your Own Back program and also the neurocentric approach. It's about um, getting the patient organized on what to do and when. Now, in, the, uh, in response to your question, how do we put that together? Um, as I walk patients through uh, or uh, students through on the Fix Your Own Back program, uh, I'll lean heavily on some of the things that uh, Stu has talked about in his books of first uh, assuring that one, they understand the nature of the problem and the nature of the injury. Um, two, do less of the things that you're already inadvertently doing to um, piss that particular structure off. Uh, three, let's work on um, seeing if you have uh, adequate uh, muscular endurance in the spinal stabilizers. Uh, most people that tend to have uh, back pain labor under some idea that they have a weak core, never really bothering to define what weak or core means. And, you know, the science is not crystal on this, but McGill did a pretty, pretty decent job with the functional capacity evaluation of putting a rubric together there. So we leveraged that. Um, and do the the lumbar functional capacity evaluation with our patients. Um, The next step, we shift to a regional interdependence model, which is an expansion of Yanda and Levitt's work from the Prague School 
by folks like Gray Cook and Mike Boyle. In the regional interdependence model, mobility in the right place and stability in the right place will make sure that they have adequate mobility in their upper back and in their hips so that they're not asking for a few extra degrees of mobility in the lumbar spine that's begrudgingly giving, given to them and creates an overuse uh, issue of those particular tissues. And then from there, we start to move into transverse rotary stability, which is that damnable test on uh, the FMS that all of us love to hate, where you're trying to figure out if you can manage rotary stability. And uh, we, we uh, address that. So the, the idea being that once we've achieved requisite level of, of lumbar spine endurance, and requisite level of mobility and the joints above and below, how do we put all that together into complex rotary movements for our throwing athletes and our striking athletes? And from there, it starts to look like a well-constructed um, uh, resistance training regimen. There is strength followed by agility, followed by power application. And we tried to um, keep an eye towards the known injury uh, vectors for uh, lumbar disc, since it's uh, uh, probably the most likely uh, structure that is suffering in a person with chronic lower back pain. <clears throat> and uh, we try to keep an eye on that to keep them out of the weeds and make sure they're not going to re-injure themselves. Like, for instance, doing a, a ton of burpees early on as a body weight exercise <laughs> because they they figured that body weight exercises must be safer because they hurt themselves doing a poorly executed um, uh, uh, deadlift. So. Yeah, and I, I like what you said. The, the misnomer initially, uh, I get a lot of people, oh, my back pain, I have a weak core, weak core. And, you know, the data in the literature, it's funny when it came on, on out. And I, I really never, uh, I really don't really address this because if somebody has something so stuck in their mind, you're really, you have to earn the rapport to change it. And the point I'm going with this is usually when you have your back pain, you have an overactive core. It is literally mm. trying to provide you the requisite stability by creating spasm, right? It's a neurological response to threat. So like your core is not weak. Um, it's quite the opposite. Yeah, what, what you just said there is another yep, got it. base Stand note it, my head and to on. the work that I do. That that threat. I'm sorry, we just had a little bit of a hang up. So I'm sorry if I'm talking over you. Oh no um, no no, go. The the that concept of threat is huge in the work that I do. Um, I remember a, a poignant moment. I used to work a, a much busier uh, clinic model and had two rooms, you know, shifting back and forth, and um, there was always a moment I would try to before walking in the door with the next patient, I take a second, I'll have their chart in my hand and I'm just kind of scanning it. And hopefully I've already looked over it in depth over coffee in the morning. And I, I take a deep cleansing breath and try to say, okay, this patient is paying me for my A game. Bring your A game, get your shit together, Philip. And <laughs> at that particular point, on that particular day, I remember thinking, where is the threat? Find where the threat is. And I thought about that later. And I'm like, that's kind of it. And that's sort of, that, that is built into this neurocentric approach. Is the threat primarily top down? Is the threat primarily bottom up? And how do you know? And that's what we teach in the coursework. Um, how do you figure out whether that is mostly a bottom up phenomena or mostly a top down? Is it a mixed phenomena? How do you intervene in each of those and so forth? Yeah, I'm going to sum that uh, last couple minutes up for our uh, 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 folks that are listening here. So needs analysis, you start with that, figure out what the problem is and why the patient's there and what their end game goals are from a back pain patient. Reduce the, the, the immediate acute pain and the threat or perceived threat using whatever tools, exercises, manual therapy you have available. Start looking above, above and below the area of complaint, joint by joint approach, regional in interdependence. Then start to build a layer of foundation of confidence, certainty, strength, 
uh, first um, uh, power is last on that list, uh, but strength first, maybe aerobic uh, capacity second, skill development, and then power, and then leave them in a good spot. That's how you would build a, a, a robust back. Uh, I, again, I, I, I made a misnomer when I called it something else a couple of minutes ago. That would be your approach to, to, to making a nice cake. Yeah, it would. Yep. Doc, well, uh, uh, we're going to close this down here in a couple minutes. I want to say thank you for your time. What closing thoughts uh, do you have? What would you like to convey to our audience, either about the neurocentric approach, building a, a robust back, or just your, your tracking over all your years and experiences in healthcare? Well, I think I, uh, I would be remiss if we left without saying the same thing that I always say to my graduates when, they, uh, when we launch them out into the wild is stay curious, stay in the literature, be a, a, clinic, a, a clinical scientist, and do good work. There are so many incentives economically to do crappy work. Resist that. Please resist that. Um, the chiropractic profession in and of itself has a unique capability or a unique opportunity right now at this particular point in time, I feel, to be able to step into a place where the literature is maturing and take a place of uh, efficacy and respect. And uh, I, I just really want people to do that. And that is, again, what we're trying to do with putting a systemized approach together that um, all of us can play with. Towards that, um, what I am working my tail off on right now is to put together an online conservatory for this neurocentric approach. Uh, online, um, an online academy, if you will. Uh, I'm moving all of the material over into bite-sized chunks of, um, uh, of online um, continuing education. It'll be PACE uh, approved. Uh, I'll also get approval for um, uh, NASM and also for uh, manual therapists as well. And the idea will be that, you know, if you've got a specific condition that you're trying to deal with in a patient and you want uh, some insight on maybe one of the ways that we might deal with it, you can go and you can consume an hour or two of content there and, and bone up on it. Or if you do that and you, you see that uh, that is uh, the, the process is compelling and you want to be a part of a community there, then we're going to put together a community um, of lifetime members and we'll continue to scale this over time. And Justin and I will meet in live streams uh, monthly and do mastermind sessions and then meet infrequently and do uh, in-person courses for the same. So uh, if folks want to make sure that they're on the receiving end of that, uh, they can join the the sign up list, the opt in list at neurocentricapproach.com. And Doc, where can people find you? What are your feeds, your social feeds, your website for your practice? Where can people find you if they have questions or would like to reach out to you? They're going to have a hard time uh, finding me on social media anymore because I've kind of uh, <laughs> chucked that habit. Um, but uh, yeah, my, my website, the Neurocentric Approach. Um, my website, fixyourownback.com, um, are the two principal things other than my clinical practice, which is solutions. And you can always email me directly and just, um, probably a good handle there would be Dr. Philip. That's two L's in Philip Snell, uh, S N E L L at gmail.com. Doc, thank you for being very generous with your time. And uh, thank you for teaching me some things and um, being a guide, a mentor, and a role model in our profession and doing it right, uh, sharing what you've learned um, humbly to you know, inspire numerous providers so ultimately we can help our patients as well. And on a personal note, thank you for being my favorite, Dr. Phil. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dino. I really appreciate your interest. Stay curious. Do good work. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Doc. Have a great, have a great day and a great summer. Likewise.